Okay, so we have to get through the developmental anatomy, and I'm going to record this and post it so that those of you that can't be here this morning can have that. Um, so I'm starting with the chapter 26 portion, development and inheritance, because some of this may be new. And so this is the portion of anatomy that goes from the fertilized oocyte, so when the sperm meets the egg, the egg is going to finish up meiosis two really quickly, and those chromosomes are going to combine and form the nucleus of that new cell we're going to call the zygote, which is one cell with 46 chromosomes. At this point, the cell can then move down that uterine tube and possibly be implanted in the endometrial lining of the uterus, where eventually we'll have the placenta develop, hormones released, and then that embryo will grow into a fetus. And then we'll briefly talk about gestation and labor. But a majority of this is talking about what happens to that cell. So in the gestation period, there's a time span between fertilization, so from that zygote to birth, it's around 38 to 40 weeks is your normal gestation period. We call the period before birth prenatal. So think of things like prenatal vitamins, before birth vitamins, to make sure that that baby is developing correctly. So prenatal period is before birth. Now embryologically, if you remember from the first week of school, embryology is the development of that human for the first two months. And so we call that the embryologic development period um, from zygote to about the first, first two months. So about eight weeks, nine weeks after fertilization is known as an embryo. Um, at this point, at the end of embryonic development, you can see all of the structures that are going to become adult organs, even if they aren't quite fully developed into that organ structure just yet. And so that prenatal period before birth, um, after nine weeks, obviously from nine to week 38, 40, there's still time to grow. We call that fetal development. A lot of structural changes have occurred. Um, that embryo is now we know as a fetus. And so by the end of the third month, so by the time that the embryo is developed into a fetus, the placenta has developed around that structure and is now functioning to keep that um, new developing fetus alive. Um, we'll see changes in the ovary at this time as well, since the corpus luteum will no longer be needed. And so the neonatal, new natal period is the first 42 days after birth. Prenatal, before birth, neonatal first 42 days after birth. Now these are very specific timelines that the uh, physician or uh, healthcare unit will use to determine what's the health, what's going on with the mother, what's going on with the developing embryo, with the fetus, with the baby. Um, there are certain stages of development, certain things that you expect to see during certain weeks and you can kind of judge what is happening, what's the health of the situation based on whether or not those um, landmarks are developing or those, those uh, features are seen. Obstetrics is the branch of medicine that deals with the neonatal period. Just so if you've heard of an OBGYN or an obstetric nurse, uh, this is a branch of medicine that deals with that neonatal period, pregnancy, labor. So we kind of call it labor and delivery now. That's kind of our conversational word instead of saying obstetric, but it has to do with that period of pregnancy and labor. So what's going on? So after ovulation, we talked about what happens after ovulation, right? That egg is going to develop inside the follicle and then burst forth. Well, then what happens? Usually the embryo can be developed uh, sort of, can I use my ink? developed here in the uterine tube. And so that's going to happen around 12 to 24 hours after ovulation. The sperm would have had to have made its way up through the cervix, you know, through the uterus, and then up into the uterine tube to reach that uh, oocyte. And that's where meiosis II would occur and fertilization would occur. If everything goes normally, that cell begins to develop. Um, divide through mitosis, two cells, four cells, until you get to this stage here, we're going to call the morula. About three to four days after fertilization, you have about 16 to 32 cells inside of that little ball, um, fertilized ball. Each of those cells would have how many chromosomes? 46 on average. 
Uh, about five, five and a half, uh, six days. You know, sometimes it's hard to tell who's measuring exactly, but as it moves its way through here, you hope that it would implant and then develop into that embryo. Implantation doesn't always occur, right? It has to be met here. There has to be hormones produced correctly. There has to be nutrients into this uh, uterine lining. But if implantation does occur, um, it will be absorbed and then grow in this, in these little microstructures down here. So implantation usually occurs around six days after fertilization. Interesting. So fertilization is going to occur inside of this uterine tube, inside of the fallopian tube. Um, you know, I kind of went through these already. So just uh, going through more of these structures, listing where fertilization occurs, where this development occurs, and then about know about when implantation could occur and where it would occur. So the egg itself, after ovulation, can survive about 24 hours. So really not that long. Um, it's about a three-day trip down the uterine tube. Um, if it's met with sperm, it could be fertilized, usually in the distal portion of the tube, um, and then it would make its way into the endometrium. We talked a little bit how if it is fertilized and grow elsewhere. That's called an ectopic pregnancy, but you want it to implant into the uterus. Look how small, a little oocyte bursting out of that ovary, but there's a gap, see, where it has to be swept into the fimbriae, or actually fimbriae, if you're gonna use the right terminology, of the uterine tube. And so there's space that it could potentially not, but that's discussion for another time. The uterine tube is lined with cilia, and so the fertilized eggs can be moved down the tube by the ciliary action, the power strokes of those cilia, the kind of given this fluid motion to move it down the tube. Um, there's this natural peristalsis that occurs due to hormone release, uh, which is this rhythmic contraction of that smooth muscle. The gamete does not always <clears throat> form. It really depends. If there's not sperm present, then it's not going to be fertilized, obviously. But if sperm is present and sperm does merge with the oocyte, then it can form into that gamete, which is that, chrom that uh, structure with 46 chromosomes. So the secondary oocyte has about 24 hours to be fertilized after ovulation before it would disintegrate or be absorbed into the body. Sperm can survive for about 48 to 72. So if you combine that information, right, ovulation occurs on about day 14 of the ovarian cycle. Sperm can survive for about 48 to 72 hours after ejaculation into the body. So there's a time period, right, where if ovulation does not occur, the sperm is not going to have anything to fertilize. But if ovulation has occurred, right, sperm can survive for days after. And so even if you haven't ovulated yet, the sperm is present, <clears throat> you can hang out for a couple of days and still fertilize in a few days after ovulation. That's how sometimes, um, you know, when it's hard, if you're trying to plan for pregnancy, you have to kind of narrow down your window of ovulation. You can use uh, thermal treatments. You know, these days, if you have the new Apple watches, right, they can even tell you, uh, when your body temperature has increased briefly, so you know that ovulation has occurred, it's kind of amazing and wild what we can do. But if you're trying to plan, right, that's what you got to do. You have to you have to have that window of opportunity, which is kind of an odd way of saying that. But really, you know, there's only so many days after ovulation that that egg could be fertilized. So if you're planning for that, then you need to know. Um, the uterine contractions themselves move the sperm. Um, there are millions and millions and millions. Not all of those are going to even get near the egg, but there are many, many more than there are of the egg, and that has to do with natural selection. Um, the egg is huge compared to the sperm, and there are millions of those, right? And there's some mechanism of selection. Uh, not everything can join with the egg. Uh, temperature plays a role, hormones play a role, but I won't able to point right now. 
before the sperm can actually fertilize the egg, it has to, it has a, a capacitation period, a period of about 10 hours where this outer shell has to break down before this nucleus could even fuse with the egg. And so again, there's that window if you're trying to plan for pregnancy where the sperm has to be able to have time to get to the egg and to break down. It wouldn't be an immediate fertilization. Um, this structure that once was hardened to stop it from breaking down and being destroyed has to become fr fragile, release some uh, enzymes, and then of course merge with the egg. So there are a couple enzymes. Uh, really, I think the question I have is about acrosin. It increases the sperm motility of the acrosome. Um, there are other things called uh, hyaluronidase and uraminidase, which are used in many, many ways across the body, but they dissolve material covering the secondary oocyte. They essentially allow the sperm to fuse with it. The secondary oocyte itself, um, it has two structures, one we call the corona radiata, which is the radiating crown-like structure around, and then, can I change my color? Yeah. Inner is the zona pellucida, or zona pellucidum, singular, which is the actual outer wall of the egg. And so there are these two outer structures surrounding the egg, and those become important, especially the zona pellucida. which is a gelatinous covering around the outside of glycoproteins, so sugars. Um, it's responsible for the viability of that developing embryo. Um, of course, there are also follicle cells out here as well. Yeah, we're, we're still inside the follicle here. And so understand that the outside of the oocyte, know that the corona radiata is this radiating crown-like structure of proteins in the zona pellucida is this sugar shell. I don't know why my, I don't know why those lines are forming, but. So the sperm itself, if you can use this image to kind of help you, has to penetrate both the radiata and the pellucida um, to get to the cell membrane. And here, when one forms, Hormones will be released from that, that's important. When one fuses, I'm sorry, and releases its chromosomes, meiosis II would complete here in the oocyte. The chromosomes from this sperm would merge with that. And there's sort of this flash where the cell itself would seal off any other sperm from being able to fertilize. This is what we call syngamy. Syngamy is fertilization, the process where sperm makes contact with the secondary oocyte. Now look, it is the title of the slide. It's a bolded term. I don't know why it keeps doing that. So that kind of tells you, hey, this is important, right? Syngamy is the process where sperm makes contact with the secondary oocyte. And we, in humans, only allow one. You only want one syngamic event. And so sperm is going to penetrate those outer cells um, around the oocyte, corona radiata, and whatever reaches the zona pellucidum and, oh, and syngamy occurs, releases its chromosomes, just to digest its way through that zona pellucida with those um, activating enzymes. There's a special protein called ZP3 glycoprotein that binds to the sperm head and triggers an acrosomal reaction to allow it to open up and dump its chromosomes inside that egg. And so the first sperm to fuse the oocyte triggers um, sort of a hardening shell around there because we don't want polyspermy. If we had polyspermy, that would be two sperm or more fertilizing that egg, and that would be far too many chromosomes, right? We said that humans can only have 46 on average. We don't do too well with too many or too few, too much information going on. And so about one to three seconds after contact, the oocyte membrane depolarizes. So that means that other cells couldn't fuse with it if they wanted to. 
And so the polarity, the charge, you could think of it changes. And this triggers a release of calcium, which causes exocytosis of molecules and it hardens the whole zone of pellucidum. And so you have this immediate depolarization, change in charge, sperm can't fuse. Then you have a hardening of that zone of pellucidum. And so nothing can dissolve through it after that first has dissolved. Um, the sperm receptors in the cell membrane are then altered. Any other remaining sperm detach, and they couldn't dissolve through there even if they wanted to. Now, there are a lot of hypotheses for how um, a sperm is selected. We often say it's the healthiest sperm, but a lot more a lot more uh, research has been going into this to allow us to know that the egg has a lot more choice. We know this from other situations in the animal kingdom, so it makes sense if, if our bodies work the same way. We know the oocyte releases some chemical attractants um, that allow the sperm to sort of move toward the uterine tube. How would it know which one to go to, left or right? <clears throat> and some go to the wrong one, right? But due to the release of hormones, it kind of uh, attracts the way that that flagellar movement works. Prostaglandins in the semen stimulate smooth muscle contraction in the uterus that may help move the sperm towards that oocyte. And then of course, temperature, uh, where ovulation occurs, temperature is heightened and that allows the sperm to locate the correct uterine tube. But it's a direct attraction. It's not like it wants to necessarily, it's a chemical attraction. And so there's what we call thermotaxis and chemotaxis, which means heat movement, chemical movement of the sperm toward the uh, oocyte. Again, I don't want to sit here and go on and on and on about it, but know that there is some selection process with the egg. The sperm don't just hope that they reach the right one. There is sort of this attraction. You can read more about that there if you would like. And so before fertilization, your haploid sperm um, and haploid oocyte, because meiosis II occurred, merge to form, again, a single diploid nucleus. This is what we call a uh, zygote. But before those two nucleus form, you can see here, there's one, there's one. These are what we call pronuclei, and they form to, they fuse together to form one big nucleus. And so they fuse into the situation where the chromosomes have to, well, the cell membrane really, or the nuclear membranes have to kind of merge together. And then you have the chromosome mixing and the formation of one. What are these? Oh my gosh, I do not know why my circles can't draw like that, but do you know what those are? I'm assuming you're saying them out loud to yourself. There and there. Those would be the polar bodies. So when that zygote, when that uh, oocyte was forming during meiosis one and meiosis two, the extra chromosomes had to have somewhere to go. So they went to the polar bodies. These would be fused, broken down. Excuse me. So within the, the egg, uh, the sperm triggers meiosis two, dumps the secondary polar body. Um, sperm loses its tail. Most of the time, the tail doesn't even reach inside the egg. Um, it just sort of releases its chromosomes and you have the fusion of those two at this true moment of fertilization. So after syngamy, technically, um, you have a true moment of fertilization and where we form what is called a zygote. From that word zygote, if there are two oocytes released, either from the same ovary, separate ovaries, and both are fertilized, those are called fraternal twins. So different eggs, different sperm, just at the same time. And so they would be genetically as different as any two siblings. Identical twins, if we have a nucleus, happens because that singular nucle nucleus splits. And so it's a monozygotic, two individuals developed from the single fertilized ovum. And so they are genetically identical because they are from the same egg. If the ovum doesn't completely separate, sometimes you get things called conjoined twins, and some body structures may even be formed together. And so understand what a dizygotic and a monozygotic twin is, and how they are different or similar genetically. 
Um, got to kind of make this brief. And so we won't go too much into our clone situation. Um, cloning technologies have advanced. You could take either the egg um, or different cells from one organism, animal in this case, remove the nucleus, put that DNA into another cell. Um, there are some situations where, well, essentially that clone is going to be the same age as the donor cell because their telomeres would be the same length. And so these clones, at least as far as how these stories went with Dolly the sheep, usually don't last, live that long because their lifespan is already as old as the parent that it came from because the parent cells, the age of that developing embryo is the age of the parent cells, which goes back to a chromosome and how the end of those structures have what we call telomeres and that's sort of the age of that cell. And so until we get better at that, we won't have a perfect clone. There are also epigenetic factors that determine whether or not that clone will be exactly the same. Um, as far as our technologies go now, it's never 100% exactly the same. There are always differences. It's always a different organism. We'll talk more about that later. But Dolly only lived about six years. Um, that famous sheep that was cloned because her cells were just as old as the parent that she came from. And also notice differences in color due to epigenetics, um, different environmental factors and genetic factors that turn on or off. So we have to get through some developmental anatomy and sort of what happens inside the egg, what happens to the um, embryo and some of those major features. The developing egg is called the ovum. Once that is uh, fused, fertilized, we call that the zygote, 246 chromosomes. This developing structure is archaically also called the conceptus, um, or scientifically, I shouldn't say archaically, scientifically called conceptus. And so that's just that structure that's going to develop into the embryo. And so here's what a 16 cell morula looks like on the tip of a pin. You know, we all started out like that at one point. These cells aren't differentiated. They don't yet know what they are um, or what they will become um, because they're inside of that morula like structure. But once that begins to go through a process of differentiation, um, that will develop into an embryo. So we're gonna learn the structure for morula, what defines a morula, what defines a blastocyst, what defines an embryo, and then what defines a fetus. And so the morula is formed from the rapid my mitosis that occurs, um, this process called cleavage, where the cells divide in half. Blasto means circle, and so these blastomeres are these circle-like cells inside of the zona pellucida, that hardened structure. And so really there's only so much room so we're still just as big as that ovum. That's why that oocyte had to be so huge um, because we have to develop inside here for a time being. And so the second cleavage occurs in the second day. You go from two cells to four cells, four cells to eight, eight to 16. And by the, uh, the third or fourth day, that ball of 16 cells is called a morula. Now it's still inside this hardened zona pellucidum, and so it can only grow that big, right? But that's a morula. And your cells are beginning to know which ones are up, which ones are down, who it's near, and differentiation can occur. And so cleavage is when our cells begin to go through mitosis. Morula is the formation of that ball of 16 cells inside that zona pellucidum. Notice inside of that structure. That's important. <clears throat> By about day five, day six, we formed what's called a blastocyst, a large ball of cells. Look how many. <clears throat> so after zygote is formed, the structure begins to move down the uterine tube. Um, so fertilization occurs, cleavage occurs, two cells, four cells, eight cells, 16, 
morula. And then we begin to develop more divisions and more differentiation and division of labor, sort of where those cells are. We begin to form this outer layer, this inner opening, and then our cells begin to form the beginning structures of what could become our openings and what could become our outer surrounding layers. Our tube of tubes, as it were. So the zygote remains in that zone of Pellucida, um, divides into two cells within 36 hours. So it takes a minute. Um, usually this occurs in the uterine tube, um, but eventually right temperature, right pH, right development, our one cell will become two. Each of these daughter cells are called blastomeres um, inside of that. So by about day two, we're only around four blastomeres big, still inside that zone of pellucidum. Day 16, nope, sorry, day three, we're 16 cells, a more eula, more eula. So that's what we all were at one point. It's a solid mass of 16 identical cells. Neither are differentiated yet. Overall, same size as the oocyte. Blastomeres are small with each division because there's only so much room. Um, cell division occurs, but no growth yet. The morula is not attached, but at this point, by about day three, day four, it probably has entered the uterine cavity. The menstrual line or the uterine lining um, is prepared at this point, thickened with secretions to grab onto that. So again, here's another structure to show you that. If there's any situation of embryo transfer, taking, freezing embryos, et cetera, um, this occurs as a transfer of the morula. And there are many reasons for that. Um, our technologies aren't quite to the point of taking an embryo and taking it out and re, like humans are too sensitive for that as of yet. There are all kinds of new researches, of course, but when we take an embryo and we freeze them, what we're doing is we're actually freezing um, the morula itself because it's still inside the zone of pellucidum and so it's still relatively protected and these cells haven't yet differentiated, kind of as an FYI. And so in vitro fertilization, in vitro, um, would be retrieving several secondary oocytes, fertilizing them, allowing the morula to form and then putting the morula back in the uterus. There are other types of fertility treatments, gift, gamete, intrafallopian transfer. So you're putting the zygote into the uterine tube after in vitro uh, to mimic the normal trip down the uterine tube. Um, transvaginal oocyte retrieval is a needle placed in the vaginal wall to capture um, any oocytes. So at this point, when the morula reaches the uterus, it's going to start, I told you, Kind of developing this division of labor in the cells, different linings will form, which the names will go over. Um, it begins to grow a little larger, becomes this fluid filled ball of cells, so what blastocyst means. And then these structures you're beginning to see this upper layer and sort of this hollow inner layer form. And at this point, the cell has been implanted or will be a about implanted, and that's important. If it's not at this point, it wouldn't be a viable pregnancy. Um, eventually, the corpus luteum wouldn't keep producing the hormones that it is to keep this endometrial lining thickened, and so you need implantation to occur so the placenta can develop and take over. And so a blastocyst is a hollow ball of cells that enters the uterine cavity by about day five. And here's where we have to get into some scientific words. And so you may want to spend some time with this. The blastocyst is a hollow ball of cells that enters that uterine cavity. So here, so blastocyst means it's hollow ball of cells still in that zone of pellucidum. The internal view, however, you begin to see some differentiation. You have an outer covering of cells called the trophoblast. 
and a fluid-filled cavity called blastocele, ball opening. And so blastocele is this opening on the inside and a trophoblast in this inner cell mass. That inner cell mass is what became us, what becomes the embryo. So a portion of this blastocyst just works as this outer structure while the inner cell mass will become the embryo. And so again, the cells begin to learn where they are and what they will become. The outer trophoblast actually becomes the fetus part, the fetal part of the placenta. So the mother will develop part of the placenta and the fetus will develop a communicating structure. Um, and the trophoblast is what is eventually going to form into that. And so here's a better view. Trophoblast is the outer portion that's going to kind of fuse and communicate with the mother's cells, what will become the placenta this way, the chorionic villi. And then this inner cell mass is what we call the, uh, I'm sorry, no, the inner hollow tube is the blastocele. And this inner cell mass is what will become the embryo. There are secretions from the endometrium that nourish these embryonic cells. It's called uterine milk, which sounds kind of gross, right? But it's these structures that ensure that implantation can occur, um, develop from glands. And so these glands are being signaled through estrogen and progesterone that released from the ovary um, in preparation for grabbing onto a developing blasto disc like this. So actual implantation occurs about six days after fertilization. It's quite a while um, before it implants. If it does, it doesn't always. Sometimes fertilized eggs just don't implant due to issues with hormones, issues with actually finding a solid location to implant where there's no scar tissue, or um, Perhaps the ovary isn't producing hormones, and so the endometrial lining isn't prepared. There are a lot of reasons. But if implantation does occur, it occurs six days after fertilization. The trophoblast, so what's going to become the uh, embryonic portion of the placenta, develops into two distinct lace layers, what we call the syncytiotrophoblast and the cytotrophoblast. The syncytiotrophoblast secretes enzymes that are going to digest the endometrial cells. And so here in the endometrium, it's gonna digest those, the outer portion of the trophoblast, the syncytiotrophoblast, while the cytotrophoblast defines that original shape of the embryo. So the cytotrophoblast kind of defines what's gonna become this embryo. So syncytiotrophoblast dissolves the endometrial lining so it can implant. Cytotrophoblast forms the cell trophoblast. Now the trophoblast is going to secrete human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. That's going to say, hey, the placenta is not developed yet. Please, corpus luteum inside the ovary, do not dissolve yet. We need you to keep producing progesterone and keep allowing us to maintain here because the mother has not developed the placenta yet. So trophoblast secretes HCG. Interestingly, HCG is what can be picked up by at-home pregnancy tests. And so usually those rely on the placenta to develop, but some of those early tests, right, quote unquote early, kind of allow you to tell um, how much HCG you have but in order to pick up a large amount. The earliest you can usually do, you know, there's only so much time, right? It takes six full days until fertilization occurs or until um, implantation occurs. And it could take, you know, one 24 hours before fertilization even occurred. So after, if you're trying to plan for pregnancy, um, sometimes you have to wait to know. You can't always know immediately unless menstruation begins to occur, then you, you, you kind of know that it hasn't worked. Anyhow, Implantation occurs about seven to eight days post fertilization. You know, the previous slide said six, seven, right? It just depends. Um, that trophoblast 
implantation really, I guess we should say six is what implantation occurs. Seven to eight, if implantation has occurred, the syncytiotrophoblast will be dissolving that endometrial lining. We'd see some absorption of that and the trophoblast will divide into those two layers. So if we could zoom in down here, we would see the cytotrophoblast is what is going to sort of define that embryo itself. And then the syncytiotrophoblast is what's going to begin to, can you see? I don't know why my lines keep forming like that, but kind of define, eat away at the endometrial lining so that it can be implanted and make sure that it's nice and solidly in there. You're going to see the growth of the placenta from the mother as well around that. It's going to grow in these finger-like extensions into the endometrium. So the embryonic portion grows this way, while the maternal portion will kind of grow around that. This would eventually become the placenta, um, but that takes about three months. And at this point, it's going to produce plenty of HCG, um, which again, picked up by at-home pregnancy tests. And at this point, the corpus luteum can stop functioning because the placenta will take over all of those hormones. So the endometrial implantation occurs, digests of the endometrial uterus, the blastocyst sinks into the endometrium, covered by those endometrial cells. Here we're going to now form what's called the embryonic period. So after the first eight weeks, we can begin to see this inner cell mass actually develop into three distinct layers. Gastrulation occurs. This is an important process where the embryo is forming. Those that inner cell mass at this point actually is becoming an embryo. And so, wow, eight weeks, that's a while. There's an actual long period before these cells even know who they are. They have to know which direction they are. They're kind of gravitropic as far as which way's up, which way's down. Um, there's some chemotropism that occurs as far as which direction, but Two months, eight weeks is when this inner cell mass is like, okay, now is our time. We've been planted, we're here, we're getting nutrients from the mother, we're getting oxygen, we know which direction we are. Um, we have this cytotrophoblastifying or outer shape, right? So these cells begin to develop into an embryo. Here, it all goes wild. It's amazing what begins to happen at this eight week period. Um, you have a bunch of things occur. We try to make it a little simpler for you because a lot of you are just pre-nursing. This is a basic anatomy class. If you ever take embryology, there's a lot more to it, a lot more to it. Do not have to know every single one of these definitions. That'll be way too much, but there are some that I need you to know. Essentially, your head kind of has to pull itself out of its butt. Uh, it's not a head or a butt. Yeah, it's just a tube, um, a hollow mass, but we have to figure out what our tubes are, and then we begin to layer those tubes with uh, a lining, and then our organs begin to develop. And so we have these nodal growth periods that occur. Um, we'll have to know these layers here. We form what's called an ectoderm, outer layer, mesoderm, and endoderm, inner layer. Um, you can read through in Tortora, um, and go through this, but we don't make you know every single step of the way. It is kind of just like a, um, oops, I can't even draw. I hate that. It is kind of just like a, this portion, just so you know, but we'll lighten it for you. So gastrulation, here we are in gastrulation. So as the cytotrophoblast forms, the amnion and amniotic cavity begin to develop. We're going to have some inner fluid. And the ectoderm and endoderm form this inner embryonic disc. And so this is occurring as the uh, cell is kind of developing and digesting. That syncytiotrophoblast is occurring. So it is occurring pretty early, but again, you're still just this cell mass. And so we kind of had this, what's going to become the amniotic cavity, um, the inner ectoderm, and 
can you even see it here, the endoderm? About day 12, your endodermal cells divide to form this hollow sphere which will become the yolk sac or energy <laughs> is present. The cytotrophoblast cells divide to kind of fill the spaces with that yolk sac with this sort of extra embryonic mesoderm, this outer structure, um, which will become your inner ventral cavity. So your which will eventually develop to become your, your inner front structures. At this point, you also begin to see mesoderm developing. Here it is in the middle. And so you had this amniotic cavity this side. You had the yolk sac this side. You have this ectoderm here, endoderm here, mesoderm middle. See it? Kind of these this mass, but you know, it's about 14 days of fertilization. It takes about two months, eight weeks for the embryo itself to really be realized, but it's starting, right? You can see it happening. So again, yolk sac, amnion, mesoderm developing in the middle. Um you know, we talked about earlier on how if this, this is occurring, if this growth is occurring outside of the uterus, um, like in the uterine tube due to a blockage or scarring or other situation or outside, this is what we refer to as an ectopic pregnancy. And it can usually uh, mean death for the mother if it is not stopped um, because the egg will keep for the really embryo at that point, keep growing and growing and growing and burst. Uh, these things can happen. I, there are stories, if you Google, you know, ectopic uh, research, you can find stories where it has occurred uh, close to the liver, um, outside the uterus, it can happen everywhere. But um, the embryo, obviously, because it doesn't have the placenta and it's not inside the uterus, won't be viable. It will eventually die and it may kill the mother on the way if it is not stopped. And so, um, it's still one of those things, it's, it's pretty dangerous as far as how it occurs. Um, just kind of be aware of that definition of what it is. Um, I think we'll stop here for the day, about day 14. That's a lot for you to go through, kind of look at this gastrulation period, know what happens um, day two, day three, day six, day eight, day 14, kind of draw yourself through, be aware of what's happening to the developing zygote and morula. Be aware of what's happening to the outer layers and be aware of what's happening to the uterus itself. Um, hopefully I'll be in class Friday and then we'll finish this up. I will have this recorded for anybody that and put up on the my Mac page for anyone that was not able to watch the Zoom or couldn't hear me through Zoom. Um, I hope that this helps you in your learning.